Um, so, my name's Ari Cedars. I'm one of the co-course directors, although I don't know how I got that title. I really don't do much of anything. Huey does all the work. Um, and I am going to be playing the role of Jamil Abelhausen today because he unfortunately has had a family emergency, was unable to make it. So um, I won't be as good as Jamil, um, particularly since he had a, an excellent presentation which I reviewed and then promptly threw out because I had no idea what he was going to be saying and quickly made my own last night. Now I know that this is a, uh, a liability for me because if this goes really well, you're gonna be like, dude, this guy doesn't prepare anything. It's just how he always talks. And if I do poorly, then, well, then I did poorly. But I'll do my best. So we'll be talking quickly about Tetralogy of Fallot. I have um, no disclosures relevant to this or anything else, unfortunately. Um, we'll go through epidemiology of Tetralogy of Fallot, anatomy and associated abnormalities, physiology of Tetralogy of Fallot, and then um, how, how we repair it in childhood, and then also um, what types of things require repair in adulthood. So Tetralogy Fallot, the most common form of cyanotic congenital heart disease, about 1 in 3,000 live births. Um, it is associated with certain maternal factors which predispose you to having Tetralogy Fallot, poorly controlled diabetes, uh, phenylketonuria, retinoic acid exposure, or exposure to this trimethodione, which is an antiepileptic. I actually had to look that up. I didn't know what it was off the top of my head. There are also certain fetal or offspring genetic features which are associated with Tetralogy of the Fallot, the most common one being a 22Q11 deletion, and I think you heard about that in a prior lecture, um, but also Down syndrome. You can actually get both Tetralogy of Fallot and an AV canal defect. It's not an uncommon association. Allergial syndrome, uh, cat eye syndrome, kabuki syndrome, or, and charge, and the vac Vector, Vector, Vectoral Associations, which I don't, I don't remember. It's an acronym for a series of things that I don't remember off the top of my head, and I always have to look up. So it's a genetically mediated problem, and this is what it looks like in the unrepaired state. Does anybody know off the top of their head what all the it's tetralogy, right? So there's four things. What are the four things? Just, say, just yell them out. What's one of them? Right ventricular hypertrophy. That's right. What's another one? VSD, good. What's the third? Pulmonary stenosis, that's right. And what's the fourth? <coughs> the overriding aorta. What the hell is an overriding aorta? I, have, I remember when I, I learning about tetralogy full of that was like nebulous to me. Overriding what? What does that mean, overriding aorta? So this is what it looks like. And I think what, when you're talking about an overriding aorta, what they're talking about is the fact that the aorta kind of straddles the VSD here. And what I'll also point out here, which we'll return to in the future in just a little bit, is that the stenosis of the pulmonary valve is not just at the level of the pulmonary valve, it's at the level of this kind of muscle bundle just beneath the pulmonary valve. It's called the infundibulum, or the conus. All the spectrum of tetralogy flow is caused by one abnormality in embryogenesis, in organogenesis, which is anterior conotruncal deviation. So, your aorta and pulmonary arteries start off life as one structure, the truncus arteriosus, which then gets divided into two stru structures by the conotruncal septum. If that septum, when it develops, is displaced too far anteriorly, it makes the aorta big and the pulmonary artery small. It basically unequally divides that truncus arteriosus into the two structures. And so, Depending on how badly anteriorly displaced that conotruncal septum is, you will have more or less pulmonary stenosis, more or less right ventricular outflow tract stenosis. And so the physiologic presentation in infancy depends on the degree of anterior deviation of that conotruncal septum. The repair, as described by Lillehay in the 1950s, is basically this. So, they would go, the surgeons will go in here. They will make a linear incision across the main pulmonary artery, across the pulmonary valve annulus. This is an important point. And right through the RV free wall to make sure they get through the kind of infundibular portion of the subpulmonary uh, apparatus. They open stuff up. They can visualize the VSD across this hole. They sew a patch across that VSD. And then they sew a patch 
over this whole narrowed area, augmenting the size and relieving the obstruction. But as you can imagine, if you have three leaflets of a pulmonary valve that all coact in the middle and you open up the annulus and put a patch on a portion of it, those leaflets don't coact so hot anymore. And as a result, I mean, it's something like 99% of patients that we see in the adult world who, had, who were born with the trilogy flow have had a repair. And the majority of the patients we see have severe pulmonary insufficiency as a result. So all of these things that I'm going to be showing you are in an adult patient. So in an adult patient, they'll frequently have evidence of delayed right ventricular conduction. And that's because due to chronic pulmonary valve insufficiency, the right ventricle with that volume load slowly stretches out over time. And it just takes time for electricity to conduct and meander its way through all that myocardium. They also will frequently have significant cardiac silhouette enlargement on their chest X-ray. And this is all right-sided chambers. Hopefully, it's just the right ventricle. But if the right ventricle is allowed to dilate long enough, eventually that tricuspid valve is also going to not meet so hot in the middle anymore. And it's going to start to leak. And then you'll start getting right atrial enlargement. Or if you get right ventricular failure as a result of just um, unfavorable remodeling of the right ventricle, then the right atrium will start to enlarge as, as right ventricular filling pressures rise. Echocardiographically, what you're looking for is exactly this. This is a parasternal short axis view at the level of the aortic valve. You can see that this is during diastole, there's wide open pulmonary valve insufficiency. Here's your right and your left PAs. This is your aorta. This is a Doppler across that area. And you can see this is systolic flow and then diastolic flow. And you see that the diastolic flow ends before the end of diastole, which is a hallmark of severe pulmonary valve insufficiency. If you were in the catheterization lab, it would be called ventricularization of the PA tracing. And it's because though the, the regurgitation is just so wide open that it almost looks like an RV tracing. So taking a step back, and this is the brief thing that I will talk about that has to do exclusively with unrepaired tetralogy flow. The rest of this is going to have to do with repaired. But it's just such an interesting thing I have to bring it up. So there's pink tets versus blue tets. That's really your pink if you have less anterior deviation of the conotruncal septum and less pulmonary st uh, stenosis, and your blue if you have more. And they have these things called tet spills. Anybody know what it causes a tet spill? It's, it's, like, it's like hokum of the RV, but with a VSD. So if you, you remember, is everybody familiar with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Obstruction becomes worse when the ventricle is less filled or when the ventricular contractility increases. So when a child who has tetralogy flow gets upset, then their right ventricular contractility increases. And that muscular infundibulum just below the pulmonary valve, the contractility of that infundibulum increases, increasing outflow tract obstruction and driving deoxygenated blood across the ventricular septal defect and out the aorta. So they get cyanotic. They get blue. And what kids do is they squat. They go, it's, it's the weirdest thing. Like, I, was, I was like, how does a kid know to squat? But I guess they just, it's, it's intuitive or the body tells them to. But what are they doing when they're squatting? They're increasing venous return to the right ventricle. By increasing right ventricular filling, you relieve some of that outflow tract obstruction. And you actually, they, they could become pink again. So that's... That's, I think, I just, this squatting phenomenon is just remarkable. I, I've seen videos of it. It's just, it's just the craziest thing. All right, so anyway, we're going to move on to adults. Most common problems in adults, they can get recurrent pulmonary valve stenosis. That's if the surgeon was doing something which has become much, much more common now, which is to try and spare the pulmonary valve when they do their uh, preliminary repair. Much more commonly, they'll have pulmonary valve insufficiency. Pulmonary valve insufficiency left unattended to over a prolonged period of time leads to progressive right ventricular dilatation, and tricuspid insufficiency, as I mentioned before. They can, in about up to 20% of cases, develop left ventricular dysfunction, which is a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. The reasons for this are not clear. May have to do with whatever genetic bad mojo uh, caused the patient to have uh, tetralogy flow in the first place. May be related to ventricular interdependence or suboptimal left ventricular filling within the relatively constrained pericardium. Um, then, obviously, as right ventricular pressures go up, if you develop TR, the 
right atrium may enlarge, and anytime you have a big and boggy right atrium, you're predisposed to atrial arrhythmias. In addition, as a result of the surgical repair that you've had in childhood, if you've had a repair of tetralogy flow, they almost always would cut across the right ventricular outflow tract and into the right ventricular myocardium. Anytime you have a scar on ventricular myocardium, there's the potential for an isthmus of slowed conduction, which is set you up, a, it's, a, it's a substrate for reentry, which is basically means that you could develop ventricular tachycardia uh, having its origin in the right ventricular outflow tract, right where that scar is. All right. The thing that we are looking at most, pulmonary insufficiency. Now, this is like, I hate these graphs, but meta-analyses are useful in as much as they kind of average all the data that's out there, so I don't have to go through a thousand studies. And there's a lot of data on, on tetralogy flow. So, when somebody has pulmonary valve insufficiency, timing of pulmonary valve replacement is problematic. In particular, because pulmonary insufficiency is generally very well tolerated over extended periods of time. So what are the benefits of pulmonary valve replacement? And this is a meta-analysis looking at that very thing. Starting at the um, top left here, you can see that, and my gosh, I can't even read this. Well, that's what happens when you prepare your slides the night before. So these, what this is showing is that Right ventricular in diastolic volumes decrease after pulmonary valve insufficiency, regardless uh, after pulmonary valve replacement in the setting of PV, uh, pulmonary valve insufficiency. Right ventricular in systolic volumes decrease. Pulmonary valve insufficiency decreases, I should hope so, unless you put a really bad valve in there. Um, this has to do, this is your um, right ventricular ejection fraction. I think that it may or may not improve. And um, yeah, this I can't remember what it is. Okay, so this is left ventricular volumes. Left ventricular volumes decrease after, I'm sorry, increase after um, uh, pulmonary valve replacement. And that's because of the phenomenon I was talking about where the right ventricle is so large within the relatively confined pericardium, it crowds out the LV. You end up getting um, improvement in the size, increase in the size of the left ventricle. Left ventricular in systolic and in diastolic volumes increase. This, I remember, is NYHA functional class. It improves, so patients feel better. So all of those things being said, why would you not just replace your pulmonary valve and everybody? Why you, wouldn't you replace it earlier? And, and I think the reason is that the pulmonary valves that we put in by and large are tissue valves. They have about a 10 to 15 year lifespan on them. And if somebody is 20 years old and you put in a valve that's got a 10 to 15 year lifespan, then you are predisposing them to needing recurrent procedures, recurrent chest opening bypass procedures, each of which has a significant liability in terms of possibility of complications and, and, um, and exposure to blood products and whatnot. Furthermore, there, uh, we recently took a look at pulmonary valve replacements. This is using statewide uh, inpatient databases um, in HCUP, and I've, we found that in the year, if you compare the year before pulmonary valve replacement to the year after pulmonary valve replacement, hospitalization rate actually increases, not including the actual index hospitalization for the pulmonary valve replacement, and expenditures increase. And it's probably related to, you know, perioperative complications, some cases of, of endocarditis or infection. And so it's not liability-free to replace the pulmonary valve. But we believe that the benefits that may be obtained from pulmonary valve replacement are kind of a longer-term scale. Furthermore, technology is advanced to the point where we now may be able to do things less invasively, where it won't mean a bypass wound, and it won't mean a new scar on your chest. And these are two new devices which are available that will allow percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement, even in patients who previously did not have that as an option as a result of very large patchless dilated right ventricular outflow tracts, which is not uncommon in tetralogy flow because, remember, there's a surgical patch there. These devices, and I, I'm, I am not affiliated with any company, so I present both of them. This is the Altera device, which is from Edwards, and this is the Harmony device, uh, which is from Medtronic. Um, and they are both currently in uh, the testing phases. Moving on to another common complication that I had alluded to earlier, which is ventricular arrhythmias after tetralogy flow. Remember I said that as a result of the ventriculotomy scar, there's a nidus of slowed conduction, which can predispose patients to ventricular arrhythmias. 
What are risk factors for ventricular arrhythmias? In this, this is research that was done by Paul Carey when he was in Boston. He actually looked at people who had an ICD already, so you're kind of looking at a biased population. But with that grain of salt, he looked at those who had appropriate shocks versus those who had had no shocks or no appropriate shocks. And he found that the risk factors for arrhythmia among tetralogy fellow patients were those who had a ventriculotomy scar, not surprising, those who had a prior palliative shunt, those who had left ventricular filling pressures which are elevated greater than 12 millimeters of mercury, those who had um, a prior history of ventricular tachycardia, a positive EP study, and those who had prolonged a particularly wide QRS complex greater than 180 milliseconds. Those are risk factors for ventricular arrhythmia. If patients have a lot of risk factors for ventricular arrhythmia based on the guidelines that just came out. It is a 1B, 1B, 1A, 1B, I think 1B recommendation that they can be considered for a primary prophylactic ICD. So when do we replace pulmonary valves based on the new guidelines? This the last thing I'll say. Um, the new guidelines actually recommend that pulmonary valve replacement for a severe pulmonary valve insufficiency be undertaken when a patient has symptoms of heart failure, which cannot be attributed to anything other than the severe pulmonary valve insufficiency. That's a 1A recommendation. In asymptomatic patients that have progressive right ventricular dysfunction or dilatation, it is reasonable, one, I think it's, if it's either 2A or 2B, to replace the pulmonary valve with the goal of preventing long-term sequelae of right heart failure. And with that, I will conclude and uh, I will uh, uh, appreciate, tell you that I appreciate your deference for, for uh, intolerance of me uh, presenting data that I, that I just put the, this presentation together on last night. Thank you.